In a long list of soldier and demo melee weapons, there's always one weapon in particular shared among the two of them that ends up sticking out for its lack of influence and utter uselessness that ends up making people ask, why does this exist? What is the point of the pain train? The point? Well, I'll tell you the point. The point is the point of the pain train. Specifically, the capture point. Whether it be a payload cart, a hill to be the king of, a defend to attack, or a CP to- My lawyer has advised me to not continue this joke. The pain train is there to secure victory for your team. And in a rather thankless way. But I recognize the heavy lifting this thing can do. So here's why I'm speaking in defense of the pain train. The pain train is an incredibly simple weapon. It can be equipped by the soldier and demo man, and when equipped, it'll double your capture rate in exchange for a 10% vulnerability against bullets. And that's the short and long of it. So what effect does this have on your gameplay? Well, the upside is pretty significant, and for a unique reason. Unlike so many other melee benefits, like the fire resistance of the sun on a stick, the speed of the power jack, or the self-regeneration buff of the amputator, the boost to your capture rate is passive, meaning you don't need to hold the weapon out to gain the benefits of it. That's a pretty big deal for classes as powerful as Soldier and Demo Man, since you now have the capping speed of Scout, with the sheer stopping power of two of the strongest classes in the game and against plenty of things that scouts are normally weak against. Do you want to cap the payload cart quickly without having to worry about sentries? Then use the pain train to cap the point, and pop a cap in that engineer all without breaking a sweat. In fact, you could easily forego using a scout at all in certain competitive formats like Prolander, in favor of just having your soldier, demo, or both use the pain train. Or you could go with all three for maximum cart speed. I mean, I would say that if the cart speed didn't cap out at times three, but I'm not here to spoil the fun. In other game modes though, stacking as many bodies onto a control point as possible is far more valuable. And when you can turn your body into two bodies for the low cost of equipping a melee weapon, that sounds like a pretty good deal. But, of course, that's not the only cost of the pain train. Because it doesn't bring more pain to the enemy gamers, it brings the pain to you. Specifically in the form of that extra bullet damage you take. And much like your capture rate, this is passive. Meaning you can't stop yourself from taking extra bullet damage. Bullet damage is the second most common damage type after melee. Being used, at least partially, by almost 50 different weapons in the game. Yes, using the pain train means you will even take extra damage from flare guns. But, how much extra damage are you really taking? How much of a difference does 10% make? Well, in order to make some kind of judgement call about this, it's best to look at damage thresholds involving bullet weapons. Let's start off with an easy one. The shotgun. Deals 90 damage at point blank range with max ramp up, add 10% onto that, another 9 damage per shot. Two shots go from dealing 180 damage to 198, meaning it's exactly the same amount of shots to kill a soldier and a demo man. Two for the demo man, three for the soldier. Scattergun, same story. 105 maximum damage will deal 210 in two shots, or 231 with the pain train. Still makes no difference unless the soldier is using the battalion's backup too. Even the family business can't manage to two-shot a demo man using the pain train. None of the shotguns in the game make a difference at their most powerful range. But what about the sniper rifles? Those are the strongest single-fire bullet weapons in the game. Surely they make a difference, right? Well, no, not really. See, even if the damage vulnerability worked the way you thought it might, giving quickscope headshots a 15 damage boost, that's still not enough. But that doesn't matter, because the damage vulnerability doesn't factor in critical damage, meaning your quickscope headshots go from dealing 150 damage to 155. That's it. But all hope is not lost for snipers. As far as I can tell, the only way to cross any sort of lethal health threshold with a single shot firing weapon is using a fully charged Machina body shot to one shot a demo man. That's right kids, if you want to take advantage of the enemy's bullet vulnerability, your best option is to not shoot them in the head at full charge, which would have killed them anyway. Uh, still doesn't work on a soldier though. Compare this to the candy cane. 
another melee weapon with a passive upside and downside. The 25% explosive damage vulnerability on that weapon completely changes how you approach every single combat encounter with these classes, while on the pain train, it's more like the extra damage against enemies being targeted by your sentry that the Widowmaker receives. It's a stat that you have to remind yourself exists. Oh hey, I guess that's a weapon that crosses the damage threshold, but you're already under fire by a sentry anyway. So I guess in the extremely niche situation where you're playing soldier, being targeted by a sentry with no ammo in it, and the engineer is using the Widowmaker, the 10% damage buff on the Widowmaker, and the 10% damage vulnerability on yourself, will allow the Engineer to two-shot you. I guess this weapon was trash all along. What this all means is that your biggest threats in terms of bullet damage are not the burst damage options. They're continuous fire weapons like miniguns, pistols, sentries, SMGs, and even syringes. These are your problems, and honestly, most of these are not something you should be concerning yourself over while in a fight, since you outclass them to such an insane degree. Unless you're in the middle of reloading, a medic or sniper is not going to have the time to pump a full clip of syringes or SMG bullets into you before they turn into food coloring. Meaning, your biggest threats are miniguns and sentries. But luckily, this weapon is in the hands of two classes more than equipped to deal with these threats. Heavies are definitely the much tougher of the two as they can use their minigun to shut down your mobility options, preventing you from rocket or sticky jumping at them. But Demo in particular shines against heavies, being able to use three grenades to easily turn the once threatening heavy into nothing more than a funny ragdoll before serious damage can be done. And both classes are at a massive advantage against sentry guns, being effectively purpose built to take them down. Realistically, the most impact the bullet vulnerability is going to have against you is from mid-range chip damage. This one small factor will hurt a bit more and can result in some deaths, but other than that, it's rarely anything to ever take too seriously unless you're already running low on health. So the upside is very practical and the downside is nothing major, so why do a lot of people seem to think this weapon sucks? Well, in the case of Soldier, it's likely because he simply has better or more fun options. I definitely consider the Pain Train to be stronger on Demo than it is on Soldier, and this is one of the reasons I'd give. The Soldier has access to the Disciplinary Action, Escape Plan, and Market Gardener. Three incredible weapons that just end up being a lot more interesting and active to use. Anytime you take these weapons out, you're making a choice to help your team advance, escape a sticky situation, or go for a high-risk, high-reward pick, on top of the last resort self-defense capabilities they offer. With the Pain Train, the only reason you would pull it out ever is for that last resort self-defense option due to the passive upside. And in combat, it's just as good as a stock shovel, which is not saying much. It's not to say that it's useless in combat, there's just better options that outshine it. But on Demo, this isn't the case nearly as much. Demo has this problem where nearly all of his melee weapons are made for Demo Knight, and as such have some pretty serious downsides attached to them. Namely, a slower draw and holster speed, which is not great for close self-range defense on a class so vulnerable to getting rushed down. This makes using weapons like the Katana, Skullcutter, and Eyelander a lot harder to use if you're playing full Demo Man and not Demo Knight, or at least Hybrid Knight. In fact, the only Demo Man melee besides the Pain Train that's meant to function as a non-Demo Knight weapon is still at its best when used with a shield and still has these penalties. The Pain Train is Demo Man's only melee weapon unlock that can function as what is effectively a straight upgrade without major drawbacks and without having to use a shield. Plenty of other classes have a similar story, and those are often some of the most used melee weapons for that respective class. But with the Pain Train, I don't see that being the case nearly as often for Demo Man. Last Resort self-defense is far more relevant on Demo Man than it is on Soldier, making it viable to equip for this reason, as well as its capping upside. But even if you wanted to use it with a shield, you could still do that. And you'd still end up taking even less damage from bullets than you would with the Claymore. Why are you like this? It's pretty good for hybrid knighting, 
especially in casual with the Tide Turner, since you can still get random crits with it, which is bullshit, but whatever. And you can use your increased mobility with your shield charge to get to the point in unexpected ways and make some game-saving caps. This is true of both Demoman and Soldier. You can combine the Scout's capping speed with not only your power, but your mobility. Scout's mobility is extremely freeform, letting him move quickly and jump around to leave his enemy's head spinning. But he's not rocket jump or sticky jump fast. His mobility is at its strongest in close range to juke out his enemies, but in long range situations, he mostly just has the ability to run forward towards the point and dodge projectiles, while a soldier or demo can fly straight to the point above everyone's heads at a thousand miles an hour and land on it with double the capture rate they were expecting in order to win the day. The sheer momentum you gain from an explosive jump, or even a shield charge, blows what a scout can do out of the water. It's like a textbook example of the difference between speed and agility. And momentum really is the name of the game with the pain train. Momentum is arguably the single most powerful force in the entire game. A heavy on the payload cart keeping the front line constantly moving makes him a far bigger threat than any sniper trying to stop him because it keeps the heavy's teammates moving forward and the sniper's teammates moving backwards, or else they'll die trying to hold their ground. A last hold on a 5 CP map won't stand a chance if no one has any time to set up a proper defense with engineers, sticky traps, and heavies. And who could forget the sheer momentum that a pub push has to offer? Every single one of those situations is exactly where the pain train shines. By not only preserving the momentum that gives your team an advantage in the first place, but also by letting you clutch a victory that much easier. If you're on offense. Yeah, okay, I'm sure some of you have been screaming this at your screens the entire video, but pretty much every statement I've made in this video has been said with a big asterisk on the end of it. If you are on the offensive team, or in any sort of symmetrical game mode like 5CP or King of the Hill, the pain train is a fantastic choice that won't steer you wrong. If you're playing defense on attack, defend, payload, or if you're just playing capture the flag, the pain train is a straight downgrade. Not by much. Again, the bullet vulnerability means basically nothing, but it is still a downgrade. I'm not sure if any other weapon in the game is like this, where its situational viability is so strictly dictated by what game mode and team you're playing on. Like, oh sure, plenty of weapons work better on certain teams. The Brass Beast is better for defenders, the Gunslinger is better on offense, but both of these weapons still have their active upsides when they're in suboptimal settings. You can still do 20% more damage with the Brass Beast on offense, and you can still run Battle NG on defense. But the Pain Train is much more binary. It's either effectively a straight upgrade, or effectively a straight downgrade. And this can even change based on the state of the game. Has your team capped on King of the Hill? Congratulations! Your pain train is now nothing but a handicap. Have you been pushed back to last on 5 CP? Better switch to another melee weapon until you guys decide to push again. Just got auto-balanced? Guess you can go fuck yourself! Because of this, I think this is the weapon that's both most deserving and least deserving of an in-defensive episode. Because people do underestimate its upsides, but there are plenty of situations where it has no upsides at all. And considering how many people play on game modes that are effectively team deathmatch, like CTF and Hightower, where the one upside of the pain train is going to get you kicked, I think it's no small wonder why it's so underestimated. But that means this weapon deserves a very specific reputation. A stereotype, if you will. This is an offensive tryhard's weapon of choice. Because it only works on objective focus game modes, because its sole focus is on completing those objectives in order to win the game, and because it's on two of the strongest offensive powerhouses in the game, someone actively choosing to equip this weapon is in it to win it. So if you see a soldier or a demo whip out the pain train or cap at double speed, don't laugh and don't underestimate him, or else he's gonna take you down to the pain train station in train town. What? How? How did you die? MAGIC!